everybody. My name is Frances Casper, and I am president of the Houston East End Chamber of Commerce. And we're very honored to present to you um, Kim Ogg, Harris County District Attorney, and her amazing team on this report of the survey that we conducted just recently. She's also going to give us a state of the justice system. But I also wanted to, to make sure that everyone knows that they are really concerned about the safety in the East End, especially with our businesses. There's so many things that you just don't even think about. Fraud, cybersecurity, all these different things that, that can happen to you. And it matters to this office. So we're so honored to have uh, Kim Ogg here today. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, them and then I'm gonna let them take it over. Uh, how is everyone to here today? Great. Good, 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 good. Well, Kim Ogg, if you don't know, she is our Harris County District Attorney. She is a native Houstonian licensed by the State Bar of Texas in 1987 and recognized as a specialist in criminal law by the Board of Legal Specialization since 1992. She has lived in the East End for 14 years as a resident of Idlewood. She's no longer here, but we're so grateful that she spent 14 years here in Idlewood. She has lots of family members in Forest Park, Lawndale, like myself, and her grandmother lived in the East, Del too, East End as well. So she is a long time experience uh, living and working in the East End. And I think, you know, we talked earlier and she just really appreciates like I do, the vibrant, colorful, multicultural neighborhood that's here in, in our East End. And she also, like me, believes that the East End is the heart of the city. So thank you so much, District Attorney, for being with us today. Francis, you just repeated uh, in beautiful summary my feelings about the East End, my uh, life work here in Houston. And I just wanna thank you for leading what I consider to be a great organization. East End Chamber of Commerce was active when I lived in Idlewood from 87 until, oh gosh, 2003, I think. Um, and I just appreciate the work that you and your predecessors and the board and the members have done to support the economic engine uh, of the East End, which I think is the economic engine given the ports presence of the city. So you're right when, uh, when you say that I think it's the heart of the city, I do. And that's why I wanted to speak with you all today. As the top law enforcement official in Harris County, I fortunately do not have the job of securing public safety alone. I'm of course joined and support through our lawyers uh, legal actions, 87 different law enforcement agencies in Harris County. To do that, uh, I need what's literally a dream team and you've got part of them here with me. So briefly, let me say I've got uh, Chief Bradford, former HPD chief and city council member, uh, longtime Houstonian to advise and liaison uh, with all of those agencies, which is a yeoman's job. Additionally, he's a special prosecutor with our office. Ruben Perez is a 40 plus year lawyer, longtime uh, employee of the DA's office, the US attorney's office, and now leads our special crimes division. So the cities and counties most heinous crimes uh, are often handled by lawyers under Ruben Perez's supervision. And then Gracie Signs, of course, is, uh, is our local and homegrown uh, first Latina city council member and a close friend of mine starting in 87 since we began at the DA's office here together. And I was very, I was really proud that these individuals came uh, to assist my administration in the administration of public safety. So why am I here? Why are we here at the East End Chamber? Because we wanted to talk to the business community directly about crime in the city. Not only do we think it is the issue in the upcoming campaigns, we think it is uh, of this election cycle that's upcoming. We think it is the issue in Harris County for businesses, for families, and for us in law enforcement. Uh, we have seen a long uh, period of crime being reduced in, uh, in America and in Houston. Uh, we've gone from the murder capital of the country in the early 80s to uh, one of the safer, large urban areas in America. But we've seen a major increase in crime and people are confused and they want to know why. 
And I think that we need to clear it up through an awareness campaign because in truth, the members of this community, this business community, along with other members of the business community of the greater Houston area are who need to step in and speak up and take action against the crime that's happening. I'm gonna to go to a PowerPoint presentation, if I could. Our mission at the DA's office is community safe, is, is to make our community safer. We do it through evidence-based prosecution and equal justice for all, which means applying the law to everyone. We guarantee a fair process, but the result is up to our community in terms of what is a crime, what crimes are worth. So we don't guarantee the results. What we do is we work toward good results for everyone. But our job is really to protect the process, bring the evidence to the courts and the juries, uh, and let our community determine the cost of crime. Next slide. Our system works like an assembly line. No one group has full autonomy or power over the system. Crime really begins with a call to the police from an aggrieved citizen or victim who says, my car was just broken into, or I was just attacked, et cetera. Police respond. That's why they are the first responders. But they immediately call us when they have a suspect in custody or a question about the case, and they come to us for filing the cases because it is our responsibility to review, uh, take the evidence that we've been presented by law enforcement and present it to the courts and to juries. That's our job. We prosecute every criminal offense other than the federal ones that occur in Harris County. The defense lawyers have one client. That's the accused and their full attention is directed to him. It's a very different job than my job. Our job is to protect the rights of everyone uh, not guaranteeing a result, but to bring the evidence forward in a lawful and fair way and where the evidence is sufficient to convict the guilty. We also work hard to prove the innocent innocent. That's a later slide. Juries have the job of acting as the community voice, what is a crime worth, whether it's a crime or not, and prison and probation and alternative solutions are how we now handle punishment. Next slide. Something you've been reading about, seeing on the news and probably experiencing yourself is the release of repeated and violent offenders. Whether you're a grocery store owner fighting a chronic shoplifter that comes in and abuses the uh, privileges he has of shopping in your store, or whether it's a robbery suspect that robbed the Chevron up the street, or whether it's a murder suspect, we see local judges setting bail in these cases. Uh, we have the opportunity to present evidence, as does the defense, but the full and complete responsibility and power regarding bail is with the judges. Now, I'm hearing that judges are suggesting that they're not responsible for bail and that this is some kind of attack on them. It's not. They are responsible for bail. That's the law. And they are the sole entity in the justice system that makes decisions on bail. So just like we must live with our record at the district attorney's office, so must our local judges. Next slide. State of our current criminal justice system is, uh, is that we are in an emergency situation. Because the courthouse has been non-functional for four years, most of four years, um, a, a commissioner responsibility, it's been very difficult for our judges to hold trials. We've managed, but trials are key uh, to giving people their constitutional due. We have a right in this country, if we say we're not guilty to a trial, but victims have a right to a speedy trial too. Unfortunately, they don't enjoy the same legal rights. So as we push for trials, trials also are scheduled by courts and not us. So we're backlogged. We have a plan, we're working with courts 
Uh, we're working with the police to try and reduce the backlog. As you know, our uh, organization is extremely understaffed and really until that's taken seriously by the governing body of the uh, commissioner's court, it will be difficult to reduce the backlog, but we have a plan that involves moving many low end cases to alternative solutions, which we think are helpful to the workforce because it doesn't allow somebody to pay their crime back to the community without engaging a permanent criminal record. So we're gonna be moving a lot of non-victim cases in that way while trying to focus and push for trial the most serious and heinous crimes that have occurred in our county. And there are thousands of them. Next slide. There's been a lot of misinformation about who is in the Harris County Jail. So I brought you the facts. You can decide for yourself about bail, about who's in jail and about what needs to be done because ultimately to have a safer city, this office needs your help. Harris County Jail right now is full of more than 5,000 offenders charged with violent crimes. There are no kids in our jail for joints. There are not people in jail um, who've committed serious crime after serious crime. And so the folks who still are in the jail, it ought to tell you something about the violence that they have um, you know, committed in the offense that they're charged with as well as their past violent crimes. But there are more than 5,000 people in the Harris County Jail charged with violent crimes today, awaiting trial. Next slide. There's been information given both ways about how bond is affecting trial. Let me let you make up your own mind based on accurate information. In 2015, there were about 3,500 individuals released on bond. That's misdemeanors and felons. They committed while on bond about 6,300 new crimes. By 2020, 10,500 people out on bail committed about 18,796 new crimes. Now, there are literally thousands more who are on bail since these statistics were put together. And it's a pretty simple correlation. The more people that are on bail, the more new crimes they are likely to commit. It's a fact. That's why the risk that a defendant poses is to be considered by our judges. If someone is too dangerous to be released, they pose too great a threat to public safety, then our law says they can be held without bail or with a bail that is sufficiently high to keep them in jail. So we hear from some members of our judiciary that they must release individuals on jail. That is only half the law. The other half, Article 17, the Code of Criminal Procedure, specifically says that judges may hold individuals in jail if they present too great a threat to the community or are not likely to reappear for trial. Next slide. Violent, criminal, violent crimes by criminals on bond are also up. Um, this shows that 72 people have been murdered by individuals in 2020 who were out on bond, some of them on bond for murder. With sexual assaults in 2020, there were 92 new rapes committed by people on bond. There were 3,000 new assaults committed by individuals on bond, and there were 634 new robberies committed by individuals on bond. Next slide. What are we doing? It's easy to point the finger, and I think that that's really beside the point. What we need is direct assistance with our judiciary and with our elected officials to let them know that the business community cannot and will not tolerate bail for repeat and violent offenders, period. The law exists. I sought to strengthen it by putting actual guidelines in the law for judges that would mandate them to 
keep individuals who presented too great a threat to our community in jail while awaiting trial. Again, these are not kids with joints. We are talking about murderers, rapists, robbers, human traffickers, the people doing the greatest amount of damage in our society. We, uh, we have got a plan that began yesterday where we have all hands on deck. All of our experienced prosecutors are going to court to work the backlog. We've created new diversion programs, next slide, that are designed to move the nonviolent offenders into some quick reparations for our society through community service, through education courses, through cleaning green, where we clean up the banks of, and sometimes the waters of Buffalo Bayou. So these are good diversion programs that allow offenders to recontribute to their community and leave the system without a criminal record. That's major. So uh, our plan is to move the backlog by taking our non-victim crimes, reviewing them. Remember, each case must be reviewed individually. Anyone who suggests that we can simply label different groups of people charged with different things one way and do something with all of them is simply wrong. Our duty is to see that individual justice is done in every case. And that's the duty that uh, we all take very seriously. Next slide. What can you do? You can help us communicate with your elected officials that you support the effort to stop the release of violent and repeat offenders on bail in Harris County. And you can publish these statements in newspapers, in your community uh, social media sites. Uh, you can do it on radio and TV through PSAs, and you can write our elected officials and call them directly. This is a matter of political will. There is no law that requires this to occur. Do not accept that. There, there's always equity in the law and equity goes as far as protecting you the businesses and the people who own and operate and work in those businesses what keeps our county vibrant and alive you have rights too so let's get together and try and uh, get the attention of some of these folks who really seem to be um, uh, doing things that are that are contrary to public safety and those are the repeat and violent offenders. Finally, please respond to your jury summons. This is not something that we should be trying to get out of as contributing Houstonians. This is something we should be, if we could, volunteering for. Uh, juries, whether they're grand juries or trial juries, are the heart of the criminal justice system a jury of your peers. Everybody's entitled to one if they want one. And it's my job to make sure we give them one. But it's up to the courts to get that done and it's up to our citizenry to show up for jury duty. Finally, call us. When you have a problem with our office, if you're having a problem with the police department or whoever's responding, if you're having a problem with uh, probation, we are ha happy to either help direct you to the correct entity or assist you with that entity in obtaining the service that you deserve and need. We don't always provide perfect service, believe me. I've got 367 lawyers to deal with 148,000 cases. And so complaints about not return phone calls or not knowing what's going on, what I can tell you is they are trying. And we have done a great deal through technology to record when we are able to reach out to you. So we now talk to personally and assist about 20,000 crime victims a year. Um, unfortunately, there are many more in this county. So when you need us, call us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for that information. I, uh, I learned a lot today and I hope that everyone out there has written all of this down and please know that we are recording this wonderful program. It will be re-aired on our Facebook page, on our um, website. And if you have any questions, um, I know on Facebook, we're getting those uh, to, sent to me and we'll ask those as well. But uh, District Attorney uh, uh, Og, I didn't know if um, uh, any of your other panelists here would like to say some few words before we go into the survey that we graciously did with your office. 
Yes, I'd love, I'd love the community to hear from them. <laughs> I wanted to uh, ask Kim about some of the efforts that she has made and changes that she has made in her office, especially when it comes to the diversity of, of uh, DAs. Uh, I think that that is very important. So Kim, if you could. Well, Gracie knows how important it is for our office and public servants to reflect the community that they represent. And nobody more than the police chief can tell you um, how important that is to community trust. Both Gracie and I and uh, Ruben Perez grew up in an office that was predominantly white. And it's, uh, it's a different world. And our community has needed more representation. So when I came to office, we focused on recruiting and hiring more Latino, African-American, Asian-American, and uh, Middle Eastern. We have people from all over the world uh, working for us. It's really incredible. Um, and what I would say about percentages is we have increased our African American hiring by about 95% and our Latino hiring by 125% in our professional group. Our administrative assistants and our investigators, um, we are also improving, but we've had more equity there in the past. We thought that our professional ranks and our leadership ranks needed to reflect the community. Gracie, and my name is Ruben Perez, and I'm a 40-year uh, lawyer, but I'm also a 40-year prosecutor. Prosecuted at the city level, I prosecuted at the state level, worked with Gracie and Kim back in the um, 80s, and then I went off to the feds. I was there for 25 years as, a, as an assistant U.S. attorney, and then when Kim got elected, I came to join Kim in her administration, I've been with her since February of 2017. It's chief of the Special Crimes of Bureau. One message that I want to give out today, and if you don't remember anything else that I've said here today, or actually two things. Number one, judges set bonds. Judges set the bail. We don't. Number two, our Constitution says that every person on our soil the United States of America is afforded the full constitutional protections of our Constitution. It does not say citizens, it says persons. So I often hear people who got here in our country illegally or who are here illegally saying, well, I don't want to report it to the crime that occurred to me because I'm not a citizen. Please remember, our Constitution, especially our administration, we're here to protect everybody on our soil. We're not here to hurt anybody. We're not here to deport anybody. We're here to protect everybody, not just citizens. And I'm going to give you my cell number. I'm not a police officer. So if you have an emergency, call the police. Don't call me. But if you ever have any questions, and like Kim said, if you have problems getting somebody to answer your call or whatever, call me. 832-317-1079. 832-317-1079. And I'll do the best that I can to, to, to help you solve your, your situation. And thank you for your time, for, for having us here today to listen to it. And, and hello, and I would just add that public safety is a community responsibility. This means that citizens, businesses, faith leaders, the police, the district attorney, and judges are all intertwined and play a critical role in keeping our neighborhoods safe. And discussions, discussions such as this is important because it helps us to understand collectively just how those roles are intertwined and help hold each of us accountable in fulfilling those roles and keeping our neighborhoods safe. Thank you. Please be here and look forward to the further discussion. Great. In the survey that we did, um, I know that the top three crimes that our businesses um, said that, uh, that affects them are one is number one is robbery followed by shoplifting and burglary of a motor vehicle. Um, is this something that you're hearing everywhere else that businesses are concerned about? Yes, and the statistics bear it out. Burglary of a motor vehicle is epidemic in Houston. Fraud is epidemic across the nation. Uh, but robbery is a particular, there's a reason that this is happening. When you look at the number of people on bail for dangerous crime, Robbery is one of those crimes that people do uh, repeatedly. 
whereas murders are often isolated, uh, fraud is often opportunistic, robbery is a way of, um, <laughs> of living and earning a living by, by people. And so when they get out on bail, we've even heard people say that they went to the next robbery to make the money to pay their bondsmen. So robbery is up in particular because we see many aggravated robbers being released after they commit aggravated robbery, even after they commit second and third ones. So it's just, uh, this is exactly the kind of offender that we are asking our judges to hold. We are not asking them to hold low level people in jail for small crimes. We are not asking them to hold poor people in jail, just the opposite. We are asking our judges to hold dangerous people in jail awaiting trial based on the evidence that we present against them. And we are asking for faster trials. And Francis, if I may just take it a little deeper as it relates to burglary of motor vehicles, one of the prime drivers here in Houston, Harris County is stolen firearms from vehicles. And, and what can we do as it relates to uh, parking lot activities or assaults in parking lots when customers are entering the restaurants or they're leaving the restaurants, we can be more mindful, one. And two, the restaurant owners, managers, uh, post signage, install technology in the parking lots, make sure the parking lots are well lit. And if you are someone who carries a firearm, store it safely and don't leave it behind in your vehicle. The Houston Police Department just last year re recorded over 3,000 firearms stolen from cars, 3,000. That's just in Houston proper, not Harris County inclusive. So be mindful of where you park, what you leave in your vehicle, and make sure the areas are well lit and do the things that we can do to help protect ourselves and report those crimes immediately. Record the serial number of your firearm. Uh, there's new technology called NIBIN, will actually, uh, when the weapon is used at the scene of a crime, the, the shell cases are left behind. Those cases can be collected and determined uh, from an evidentiary standpoint, in my view, it's more useful than the serial number in some instances because the Nibin uh, technology can determine whether that weapon would, was used to commit a crime or not. The serial number simply helps identify the proper owner. So those are just some tips that we can do as citizens and business owners as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Another one of the questions was, uh, what is your business done already to protect the business from crime? And the top one is, premise security enhancements, and then followed by technology installation. Are those the top two, or have you heard anything else that, that's important to business owners? I think, I think those, are, those are key points that uh, feeds into what I said earlier about public safety being a community responsibility, and all of us have a role to play as it relates to installation of technology. Technology helps us in law enforcement and as prosecutors collect objective evidence to some extent to help prove or disprove what happened at a location. Technology is less expensive today than it used to be. So I would suggest that the utilization of technology is very relevant today and almost uh, necessary today when it comes to collecting evidence to support uh, prosecution of crime. Not only will I second uh, the chief's affirmation that technology is the best crime fighting tool for property crimes on a premises. But I really like that your employees and of the members of this organization are being trained. I would presume it's on that technology, on personal safety and on uh, risk reduction through shredding and the kind of things, tightened inventory control that I see here. But back in the day, as they say, um, when I ran Crime Stoppers in the 90s, very few convenience stores would either install cameras or would keep up with their cameras. And, you know, it, those are easy crimes to solve when you have a photo of the person robbing the store. But many times in our banks, even we saw the cameras focused more on the employees to prevent internal theft without having the external protection as well. So, 
I think making sure that your technology is focused on the criminals. And if you want to protect yourself internally from internal theft and toy theft, that's important too, but it shouldn't be an either or. Very good point, very good point. I love this. Um, one of the other questions is, how frequently does your business communicate with law enforcement personnel assigned to the area? And the number one choice was monthly. Um, how, how do you, actually, um, it says never. Um, so I, I guess that, that after, after never, it's monthly. You know, both of them are probably low, low to begin with. Uh, any suggestions and reasons why they should maybe create a relationship with law enforcement and, and do that more frequently? I think that ties into what DA Hogg just mentioned about training the employees and the employees uh, plus the managers and supervisors understanding what they should do if something were to occur. After the fact it's late, training is important. Uh, who should they call? What number should they call? If in fact there is an incident at the location, first of all, be prepared in advance to collect the evidence that may be necessary and very useful in uh, solving the crime. Proper installation of technology to capture activity, uh, employees making certain types of observations, what suspects did what, what was taken, how was it taken, what did the suspects say, what did they, how did they depart, uh, that type of activity. If someone is injured, please seek assistance for the injured person, but be mindful the rest of the scene, leave it as is until police arrive. Police need to see the scene as it was during the activity. And how often uh, an assessment should be done is I would say frequently, and, and I, want, I don't wanna put a timeline on it, whether it's monthly, annual, whatever, but risk assessments can be conducted by local law enforcement agencies, at no cost, and there are private firms that will conduct risk assessments at the locations as well. But it's important to have the employees train who to call, when to call, what number to call. They should know the managers, the supervisors, the employees should have a relationship, a contact number with your local area police commander. They have PIP meetings. We just had our citywide a PIP meeting last night it was well attended by a number of people from around the entire city of Houston, but there are local pit meetings and super neighborhood council meetings and civic club, homeless association meetings. Engage yourself in all of those meetings and invite your local police officers to those meetings and the district attorney's office. We are at many of those meetings also in the neighborhoods. You don't have to come downtown to find a representative from district attorney Kim Mark's office. We are in the neighborhoods as well. And don't ever hesitate in calling law enforcement. Even if you think, well, I'm not so sure this is happening or I'm not so sure that, that it's really important, you call. It's not going to hurt you to call. It's not going to cost you anything to call. Call, and if it doesn't, doesn't lead to anything, then it doesn't lead to anything. You might have saved a life. Um, you know, I, I speak a lot on human trafficking, for example, and somebody says, well, I saw this in situation, and but I, I just decided to, to call. And sometimes all those tips lead up to something. So if we, you, you, you're the eyes and ears of our community. You, we can't have police officers at every street corner. And Francis, I want to add another critical piece to this uh, equation. If you are a victim, make sure that you capture the responding officer's name and identifying information and get an offense report or incident report number. Because subsequently, if you need to call the next day or the next week and get the status of your case or from this office or the police department, we need an incident number or a case number to determine the status of that case. And even if an official offense report has been filed, you know, there are some instances where there has been an incident and the victim will call the office and we start conducting uh, a review to determine the status of the case. And we discover that an official offering report has not been filed and one should have been filed. The district attorney's office does not conduct preliminary on-scene investigation of these type offenses. 
law enforcement agencies, one of those 87 that DA Og mentioned earlier, that is what they do. We rely on them to go to the scene and connect and conduct a preliminary scene investigation and collect the evidence at the scene for a preliminary investigation standpoint. And, and that adds to, you know, if you have something documented, excuse me, if you have something documented and sometime later something similar occurs, you have that document, you sometimes you can establish a pattern that helps law enforcement uh, investigate crimes. I love that. And I, I love what you're saying about, because one of the questions is who do you call first? If it's HPD constables and and it looks like the local police department is who is the number one people that they call. And that's probably because they don't have the, the numbers to, to the others. So um, maybe, and, and I, I want us to continue these kind of conversations, but maybe we'll do it again and we'll bring invite someone from our constable's office, from HBD, uh, and, and just to share, and the sheriff's office to share their numbers so that people will know where, where to go. And we might put a little flyer together of the numbers, the important numbers and the other tips uh, collaboratively from all of our organizations to the businesses in the East End. Does that sound like a good? Just, we maintain the contact information for all the law enforcement agencies. I got my update yesterday. We'll just forward it on to you. It's the main numbers. It's not, you know, the chief of police personal phone, but because uh, <laughs> Chief Finner would, is a busy guy. But mm -hmm. let me just say, uh, follow up on your cases. If you want to know what happened to a case, where an arrest was made, you can contact our office if we haven't contacted you, and we can tell you where in the process the case is. That's often frustrating for victims, especially victims of violent crime. So we want to connect with the victims. We've really worked with the police to try and improve um, getting emails and phone numbers and cell numbers and next of kin numbers into the reports so that it makes people easier to reach. And believe it or not, one good thing from the pandemic is that people became easier to reach. Uh, and so that's something that I hope we keep up. So we'll send you those numbers. They're all public numbers. Feel free to publish them. Great. One of the other questions was, what role can the business community play in reducing or preventing crime? Um, there was a lot of, of interesting comments here, but what one, one thing that you would tell these businesses to do? I think we have to be unified as a full community that we, while we want fair courts and we champion the civil rights of everyone, that we too have a right to public safety and that we must stop the release of repeat and violent offenders on bail while awaiting trial. That is the thread that is unwinding public safety not just here, but in the urban areas of America. I'd submit this is not good for our communities. It's not good. Um, it, it's, it's making for a lot of uh, fodder for, for volatile politics. And um, I think we need to pull together as a community in the name of public safety right now. And one other question is, uh, what actions can a business owner take to remove someone bordering on their property? You can contact the police department and ask them to come tell the person to leave. If they don't leave, they can be arrested for trespass. You can post no trespassing signs. But a program that I want everyone to know about before I leave is our mental health partnership with the Harris Center and with all of law enforcement. When a mentally ill person, and that's often who's loitering on business properties, uh, urinating in public, that kind of thing, hanging out at the bio, homeless. We used to jail about three to 5,000 of those individuals annually. At huge cost, we make them worse in jail. And the biggest problem for the business community is they just keep coming back. So we worked with the Harris Center to create a diversion center. It's named the Ed Emmett a Mental Health Diversion Center. It's a bipartisan effort that we made with county, uh, city, and state government through some state senators. And anyway, we got funding for this. And that is where the police now will come take somebody from your property, but instead of them going to jail, bonding out almost immediately and returning to your property, they go to this diversion center. It's in Southwest Houston. And we are having really good results. Why? 
because people get an immediate assessment. You know, they get um, some hot coffee, a shower, a cot, they stabilize them. And many times that's what people need to start back on the right track. Additionally, many of these people have already been handled by our mental health authority, and this lets them hopefully resume their medication schedules. We really are seeing great success in lowering the recidivism or repeat offense rate of those offenders. So mental health, we, can, we consider mental illness a mental health problem, not a criminal problem. This is not violent criminals, this is loiterers, but we know they cause you problem business folks. We know you have a right to run your businesses without that kind of public safety threat. And we are simply trying to create and work toward a more effective solution uh, for keeping such individuals off your business property. And that great answer may have answered this question, but, but it's such a great question from Ryan that I wanted to uh, ask it of you, uh, District Attorney Odd. Um, so he says, I know Ms. Ogg has been challenging the bail reform for many years, which is against the pressure from the county. During this time or recently, um, has the county recognized the pattern that exists between new crimes and violent offenders being released under bail reform? No, in fact, the county's position has been that there's been no increase in violent crime by people on bail. I'll let this audience decide for themselves. We've brought you the information that we have. This is not a cause celeb, and this is not a political fight. Public safety is not a political football. We either have it or we don't. And right now our community is challenged and our justice system is in an emergency state. We need the business community's help. And um, I think that everyone uh, prefers a community for our family and our businesses and, and everyone here uh, that's safe and it's orderly. I agree. So uh, are there anything that we did not ask that you wanted to add? Because this dialogue is, is incredible and I really appreciate your time. Well, just a shout out to all the vendors who I shopped with when I lived in the East End. So um, hey to everybody at the Chevron, at the, uh, at the Fiesta, at the what used to be wine gardens, you guys, that's how far I go back. So um, La Victoria, so many places I miss, El Jardin. So <laughs> thanks to everybody, uh, the folks who are really driving the economic engine of Houston, we're behind you and we support you. And I appreciate your time. And I want to thank all of you for the work you do for this community. Great. Great. Chief Bradford, uh, Ruben Perez, Tracy, any, any closing remarks? No, just, just quickly echoing what the DA has said, we really do need the business community to step up and weigh in and help uh, get the message and support the position that uh, nonviolent, low-level offenders, we understand that there are alternative solutions to deal with uh, defendants in those type cases and DAR has uh, revamped the office strategy to address uh, some of that, but repeat and violent offenders, we need the business community to step up and say, you know what, public safety must be priority number one and to the extent that our process continues to release repeat and violent offenders, that must cease and desist for the greater good of all. Thank you. I want to echo what Chief Bradford said and, and my boss, D.A. Ogg, said. I remember, we're citizens, too. We're not only public servants, but we're private citizens. And we also have families. We also have uh, uh, properties that, 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 um, that we dearly love, our families. So we need your help because, this is, as D.A. Ogg said, this is a public safety issue. And we need your help in combating this situation. We don't set bonds. The judges said bond. And one of the, I, I think uh, the important message that I have uh, often received from, from Kim has been uh, that public safety and, and Chief Bradford as well uh, is, is a, uh, a team effort. And that is, you know, the DA's office, law enforcement, and the community. And so as community members, I think it's important uh, to also step up to the plate. When you are called for jury service or you're called to be a grand juror, please, please do participate. It's important for everyone involved. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, District Attorney uh, Oz, uh, Chief Bradford, Ruben Perez, and my dear friend, Gracie Sion. It was an honor to have this community conversation on business and public safety. As we all know, small businesses are the backbone of our country and also here in the East End, and keeping them safe from crime, from cybersecurity, from fraud, and other things that we talked about today is the key to their success. So I hope that we will continue these types of conversations. Um, thank you all, everyone, for watching this. To all, uh, the, and thank you very much for everyone who completed our survey. Please reach out to our office, to the district attorney's office, to see how you and us can work together for your business safety needs. Uh, we will be sharing this recording on our Facebook page and on our website in case you would like to let someone else know that would benefit from this great program. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for giving us your time today and I look forward to talking to you all soon.